Hello everyone and welcome to the video. Today we're doing 150 things that you may not know about Portal and Portal 2. Let's get started. Starting at number one, I'm going to go over the obvious. Portal and Portal 2 are both set in Aperture Science Laboratories. At number two, the name Aperture Science Handheld Portal Device can be abbreviated to ASHPD or A.SHPD, which is very close to the shorthand name of Adrian Shepard the protagonist of the Half-Life episode, Opposing Force. This was even hinted as a red herring, as the keyboards on the computers in Aperture all have those letters lit up. Portal is set in the same universe as Half-Life. Aperture Science and Black Mesa, the lab you have to escape from in Half-Life, are rival companies that both compete for government funding. Cave Johnson even hints that Black Mesa copy Aperture's patents and ideas, causing them to go bankrupt. The Borealis, as seen in Half-Life 2, Episode 2, is an Aperture science ship. It's believed that the Combine are looking for the Borealis because of Aperture's feat in teleportation. It is also believed that the Combine never found the Aperture laboratories, as there is no evidence for this in either game. However, Aperture has been slightly affected by the Black Mesa incident, as in the Portal 2 official soundtrack song, Robot Ghost Story, you can hear what sound like poison head crabs below you. Here is the comparison. There are three types of defective turret, one with no outer shell or bullets, one that's built sideways, and these both appear in Portal 2, and one that just can't fire bullets, which was in Portal 1. There are actually eight types of turret. Three types of defective turret, the oracle turret, the normal turret, and the rocket turret, or the rocket sentry, and the prima do donna turret, the fat turret that appears in the turret opera. There was supposed to be a ninth type of turret, called the hover turret in Portal 2, but it was removed. It can still be found in the files, but it doesn't use its own model. There's also supposed to be two other types of gel. Adhesion gel, which was to enable you to walk up and stick to walls, and reflection gel, which was used to deflect lasers. Adhesion gel was removed after playtesters complained it made them feel sick. Reflection gel was removed and instead replaced with the discouragement redirection cubes. The ideas for the gels were taken from the game Tag, The Power of Paint. A Portal 2 mod was created from this called Aperture Tag, in which used a paint gun and not a portal gun. Little side fact here, the music for Aperture Tag and Portal Stories Mel was created by Harry101UK or Harry Callaghan, one of my favourite YouTubers. Aperture Tag can be bought on Steam for $3.99 or $4.99 and Portal Stories Mel can be downloaded for free. The comic Portal 2 Labrat bridges the gap between Portal and Portal 2. It tells the story of Doug Ratman, a schizophrenic employee of Aperture Science. There is an undetermined amount of time between Shell being put in suspension and the second awakening in Portal 2, as the announcement system is seemingly broken. It could be any time between 9 days or 27,003,973 years. It is more likely to be very closer to the second figure, as the facility seems very demolished. It is told to us that however long Shell was in extended suspension for, GLaDOS, the main antagonist of both games, had to watch her death on loop for the whole time. This is due to a black box quick save feature. GLaDOS told us that Chell was abandoned at birth and seemingly adopted by Aperture as a test subject or maybe by one of the staff. This is further evidenced by the fact that one of the potato power projects in Portal 2 Bring Your Daughter to Work Day section is named Chell. It says that it was a part of her daddy's work, perhaps an adopted father? Chell was originally test subject number 1098, but was moved to number 1 after Ratman saw her potential and saw that she would never give up. At some point between Portal and Portal 2, Chell's advanced knee replacement is removed and replaced instead with the long fall boots. Chell's face is actually modelled off of a real person, Alicia Glidewell. Chell's name is never mentioned before GLaDOS's cores are destroyed in the Portal 1 ending. Before this, she is only known as Subject Name Here. In the original Portal 2 ending sequence, the stalemate resolution button was to be destroyed by Wheatley, in which the announcer would say the stalemate would be resolved if the stalemate resolution associate would say yes. This led to a blackout in which, upon pressing a button, Chell would say yes. This was cut due to playtesters finding it hard to find out who was actually saying yes. Doug Ratman has a total of 12 dents in each game, 5 in Portal and 7 in Portal 2. The first ever Ratman Den is in Test Chamber 16 in Portal, behind a panel being held open by weighted storage cubes. 
The last black man den is in test chamber 17 in Portal 2 and can only be accessed by using a hard light bridge. The song Ghost of That Man is only played twice in Portal 2. Once right before you collect a single portal device and once in the den in test chamber 17. The title of the song Ghost of That Man implies that he is dead. However, it is also thought that he managed to get into extended relaxation and survived. During the song, Ratman can be heard muttering and talking gibberish, probably because of his schizophrenia. This is the closest I can get to translate the gibberish, and bear in mind that this is my opinion and is probably completely wrong. <laughs> To me, this sounds like Ratman was in charge of the GLaDOS project and didn't want to activate as he saw foresaw what would happen. He asked his uncle, Cave Johnson, the leader of the company, for advice, despite him being dead at this point. Perhaps he is seeing him as a hallucination? He doesn't want to start GLaDOS as he knew Carolyn and he saw it as a waste of life and a mutilation. He then refers to the Borealis, saying it's been stolen and he thought he let his dead uncle down. He says he was right to fear GLaDOS as everyone is dead now and it feels like the end. He feels like he is being judged for his mistakes, possibly by his companion cube. He then re-refers to the Borealis, saying it's gone, perhaps lost in a huge portal storm? He then seems to be addressing Chell as a child, maybe imagining her and telling her it's okay. This is probably because it was her first time in the facility, and she was scared of what would happen. In the Perpetual Testing Initiative DLC, many alternative universes with alternate apertures are created. In one universe, Cave, in Doug Ratman's voice and body, hijacks the intercoms to yell out and warn everyone that Ratman, presumably in Cave's body and handling the company typically as the real Cave would, is embezzling from the staff's paychecks. The founder of Aperture Science, Cave Johnson, started the company in 1943 to develop shower curtains for World War II soldiers. Aperture started off as Aperture Fixtures. It changed its name to Aperture Science Innovators sometime between 1943 and 1947 because it sounded more hygienic. He became a billionaire after acquiring contracts to sell to all branches of the military except for the Navy. Cave Johnson brought an abandoned salt mine in Upper Michigan where the enrichment center was built. There is actually a definite alternate location in Cleveland, Ohio. There may be other alternate locations. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, Aperture began testing on the best of the best. Olympians, astronauts, war heroes, etc. They were the second largest contractor for the Department of Defense, right behind Black Mesa, between 1952 and 1954. Some of their inventions in this time included the repulsion shell, the weighted storage cube, the 1500 megawatt super colliding super button, and the Aperture Science portable quantum tunneling device, an early and significantly larger version of the modern portal gun. In 1968, Cave Johnson attended Senate court hearings on behalf of the company regarding Aperture Science's involvement with the disappearance of astronauts, likely due to many of them not returning from testing. By the 1970s, Aperture Science was financially unstable. The Olympians, astronauts and war heroes that were being used as test subjects were replaced with homeless people who were paid $60 for their time. But Aperture Science continued its research and created propulsion gel. In the 1980s, test participation became mandatory for all staff, raising the quality of test subjects but diminishing employee retention. Aperture's financial problems were severe at this time, but development continued. Moon rocks are used to create conversion gel, as they are a great portal conductor. Cave Johnson was poisoned by his experiments of moon rocks and became deathly ill. As his health degraded, he assigned his leadership to his assistant Carolyn, asking that her consciousness be placed in a computer. He said this on tape, so everyone would hear it at least 50 times a day. 
Testing continued with the hope that jumping through portals repeatedly might somehow cure Cave of his illness. Aperture Science also began development of its genetic life form and disk operating system, an artificial intelligence which would be used to oversee scientific testing. In 1998, the system was brought online for the first time during Aperture Science's annual Bring Your Daughter to Work Day. GLaDOS instantly became self-aware and homicidal, and she flooded the enrichment centre with a deadly neurotoxin, killing most of the scientists. Aperture Science was effectively shut down and placed into a permanent testing cycle. Cave Johnson has another assistant called Greg, who appeared in Perpetual Testing Initiative DLC. The announcer, played by Joe Michaels, was originally just going to be GLaDOS. The announcer is not a sentient AI, unlike GLaDOS and Wheatley. He just has preset lines and cannot interact with the player. The name of the black stick figure that you play as in the Perpetual Testing Initiative and who features in the trailer is called Bendy. Valve didn't intend for the cake is a lie meme to be so big. Instead, they had Hoopy the Hoop, who falls in front of you after you defeat GLaDOS and in some stages in Portal 2. During the development of Portal 2, you weren't supposed to play as Chell. Instead, you were to play as Mel, who was cut but re-added as a mod. Playtesters didn't like this, as they didn't like it when GLaDOS did not recognise them. There was also supposed to be a small core on wheels, called Betty, who would follow you around during the Portal 2 development. The adventure core, featured in the Wheatley boss fight in Portal 2, is called Vic. All of the corrupted cores found in Portal 2 are voiced by Nolan North. When GLaDOS sends the adventure core up for Chell to attach in the final boss fight of Portal 2, he is hanging and swimming on a in a manner not unlike that in which it would be expected from a stereotypical adventurer coming to the rescue. One of the adventure sphere's voice lines make reference to as many black belts in various martial arts, including La Arte. La Arte was first mentioned in a hidden web page of the war update in the Valve multiplayer game Team Fortress 2. In some unused audio files, Rick can be heard yelling at both the space sphere and the fax sphere. This could be used for three things, used when they're in the cage right before the boss fight begins, while on the central core body, or he and the fax sphere are actually going to be in the ending cutscene. When Chell places the final portal on the moon, Rick is sucked out into space before Wheatley and the space sphere. In Portal, if cheats are activated and you type into the console impulse underscore 101, you'll get all of the weapons from Half-Life 2. With some minor additions to the game, you can spawn in all of the entities from Half-Life 2, including the vehicles. Portal never had its own executable program. Instead, it used HL2.exe as a base. This is why it is easily compatible with the Half-Life 2 models and entities. This is because it had quite a small team working on it. Activating cheats and using impulse underscore 101 in Portal 2 does nothing, but impulse underscore 102 spawns a skull from Left 4 Dead, as they use the same base programming and source version. Both Portal games were developed by Valve and use Havoc Physics and the Source Engine. A new Portal game called The Lab is set to release in the next few months and is in an alternate universe where Aperture Science is present. It is made to show off the HTC Vive and Steam VR. Unlike the other two games, the lab uses the new Source 2 engine. The anger call from Portal 1 is voiced by Mike Patton because Valve said that Ellen McLean didn't sound angry enough. The bomb model from Portal 2 looks very similar to the anger call from Portal 1. The Animal King turret first appears on a screen in Chapter 1 of Portal 2, then makes a reappearance right at the end of the game at the back of the turret opera. Animal King is a registered trademark of Aperture Science, established in 1998. During PAX Prime in 2012 in Seattle, Portal 2 writers Chet Falasek and Eric Walpole revealed that Chell was supposed to find a lost tribe of turrets, and the Animal King turret was to marry off one of its turrets to Chell. During the Cooperative Testing Initiative development, GLaDOS put Atlas in a vol cage and made him brandish a frying pan. Prior to the release of Portal 2, the Curiosity Core's model from Portal 1 was used as a stand-in for the unused hover turret. The Fax Sphere evaded going into space when Wheatley was sucked up to the moon. Franken turrets were created by Wheatley after he took over Aperture as a means to replace Chell as a testing candidate. When they failed to step on buttons, he got mad. You can find the Borealis Dry Dock in the 1970 section of Old Aperture, near some vitrified blast test stores. Instead of speaking like standard turrets, Franken turrets make unusual chirping sounds, 
although they sound like sped up and gargled voice clips, which can be roughly translated to, let me think about this, what are you doing? Up and please put me down. Their cube fixtures feature a modified version of the Enrichment Center logo, reading Wheatley Laboratories instead of Aperture Laboratories. This change is also visible on the loading screens during the time in Wheatley's testing track. The turret heads on the cube are not consistently patterned. Occasionally they will be missing half or all of their plating. If placed right side up, they attempt a headbutt chow to no effect. If they are moved against one of Wheatley's screens for an excursion funnel, they will smash it after a short amount of time. While they do not speak themselves, they do appear to understand speech, since a number were disabled by Gladys's paradoxal statement. Wheatley is unaffected by Gladys's paradox, which suggests that Franklin turrets are not only sentient, but they are actually more intelligent than Wheatley. Wheatley did not l get electrocuted for telling the Franklin turrets to get on the button, like when he tried to help Chell during one chamber. This could indicate that Franklin turrets don't actually qualify as test subjects. Whenever Chell picks one up, they tuck their turret legs in and shiver, looking visibly terrified. This may be because of something Wheatley had done to them before, after or during their creation. Also, as Wheatley is very frustrated with their lack of progress, he may have been physically punishing them. A Franken turret can be found on one of the walkways shortly after Chapter 9 begins. However, before Chell can reach it, it is destroyed by a poorly aimed crusher which Wheatley intended for Chell. You can still save the turret, but it requires some skill. A Franken turret can be seen crawling along near the back during the turret opera, and is frequently mistaken for Doug Ratman. During the co-op credits, a Franken turret can be seen hopping along in front of the conveyor belt. Another also appears in the belt to be scanned, as do most of the NPCs and objects in the game. Unlike normal turrets, the turret portion of a Franken turret cannot be destroyed by lasers, possibly because Wheatley has stripped them of their ammunitionary parts, and thus made them non-explosive. The developers of Portal 2 note that the drawing on in the cube of a Franken turret was initially to make them cubical when picked up, but it was so cute they added shape animations and wide-eyed reactions to the turret to make the players sympathise with their plight. GLaDOS stands for Genetic Life Form and Disk Operating System. It is unknown what is on the Borealis that is so vital to Half-Life's plot, but it is likely some sort of local teleportation experiment or transdimensional teleportation experiment. GLaDOS resides in the central AI chamber. GLaDOS can control or destroy the entire facility. Although GLaDOS starts off as an antagonist in Portal, and the first half of Portal 2, she becomes a tritagonist at the second half of Portal 2. GLaDOS and all the turrets are voiced by Ellen McLean. Carolyn's personality lives in GLaDOS because after Cave Johnson knew he was going to die, he said Carolyn should be put in his computer. Only two days after GLaDOS was destroyed in Portal, the Black Mesa incident happened and the Combine invaded Earth and started the Seven Hour War. GLaDOS went through a few stages of development in Portal and at one point was just a disc in the ceiling. The boss fight from the Portal beta was dramatically changed too because at one point it was supposed to be a chase sequence. There is an alternate central claw, GLaDOS chassis, which is a prototype for the current one, which can be found in the Art Therapy Co-op DLC. In all other alternate universes, GLaDOS was shut down and never restarted after the initial failure. GLaDOS completely changed at some point after being shut down in Portal and restarted in Portal 2. Ellen McLean voices at least one character in every game in the Orange Box, and two in Portal. The Intelligence Core from Portal is also known as the Cake Core, as it lists ingredients for a deadly Black Forest Gatto. Unlike the other cores, the Morality Core appears to be unable to speak or simply decides not to talk. The Morality Core seems to be in charge of the Rocket Century. The Oracle Turret appears twice in Portal 2, once in the Pneumatic Transport Tube in Chapter 1 and again in Chapter 5 where it gives voice lines foreshadowing the plot. The Oracle Turret gives the following lines, Get mad, meaning Cave Johnson is angry in the intercoms in Chapters 6 and 7. Don't make lemonade, same reference as Get mad. Prometheus was punished by the gods by giving the gift of knowledge to the man. He was cast into the bowels of the earth and pecked by birds. GLaDOS told Wheatley that he was designed to be a moron, which triggered Wheatley to send Chell and GLaDOS into our old aperture unintentionally. After GLaDOS and Chell went uh, down on the fool, GLaDOS was pecked by a bird and the bird flew away. It won't be enough. What Dog Rackman observed about the morality core intended for GLaDOS 
This suggests that the Oracle turret was one of the original sentry turrets seen behind Ratman in the Aperture Laboratory, where he's working on the portal gun. Alternatively, it may refer to ha how seeing Chell was unable to satisfy Wheatley in Chapter 8. Or, it could also mean that their uh, paradoxes will not be enough to stop Wheatley. The answer is beneath us. Gladys's true identity is hidden among Johnson's intercom messages, playing deep underneath Aperture. Alternatively, this may be referring to the mobility gels found beneath jail when the Oracle turret is found, which are key to defeating Gladys. None of the corrupted cores would have been attached without the conversion and repulsion gels, and the fax will have never been able to use been used as the finishing blow to cause attempted core transfer without the propulsion gel. Her name is Carolyn, remember that. Carolyn, the assistant of Cave Johnson, is the person whose sentience resides in GLaDOS. That's all I can say. The last quote played by the Oracle Turret until picked up again. Both of the co-op characters, Atlas and Peabody, were created from scientific calculators. Peabody appears briefly momentarily in the single player campaign. Upon arriving in Wheatley's test chamber 15 where he makes the exit, Peabody can be seen in a newly created area watching Shell before panicking and running through the exit. It is possible to access this area through a glitch before Wheatley moves the ball, but Peabody does not move and is not a solid entity. The party escort bot uses a placeholder model in game named GhostAnim.mdl, which uses the texture of the bean cans found throughout the game. Shooting a portal on it or anywhere near it will crash the game. It was nicknamed Bean Cube to Portal Alternate Reality Games. Ace Sphere's character was inspired by an advertisement for the Oregon Coast Aquarium. To celebrate Skyrim coming to the Steam Workshop, Valve created a mod to have the Space Sphere drop out into a nearby home just outside of Whiterun. In this mod, he is known as the Space Core. Wheatley is voiced by comedian Stephen Merchant. Wheatley was designed to be an intelligence dampening sphere, one of the cores to be attached to GLaDOS in order to generate an endless stream of terrible ideas and inhibit her mental abilities. He was removed from the chassis and put into storage for unknown reasons. After GLaDOS was destroyed in Portal, all deactivated cores in storage were reactivated and used to maintain the facility. Wheatley was in charge of the Human Test Subject Relaxation Centre. A few centuries afterwards, Wheatley decided to try and escape. He needed a human to help him, so he scoured the Enrichment Center for still-living humans. After Wheatley took control of the facility, he decided not to maintain any of the core functions. During the 2011 Video Game Awards, Wheatley was nominated for Character of the Year. He then made an appearance on the event which depicted him in space, as he states that he would be more honored for the space shuttle rescue. Portal 2 then won the award for Best Performance by a Human Male, with Stephen Merchant's portrayal of Wheatley. In the developer commentary of Portal 2, it is revealed that he was originally intended to have tried escaping with other subjects prior to waking Chell up. This still remains in the game as during the final boss battle, he says that he tried escaping with six people prior. However, due to his nature and the heat of the battle, it is unknown whether he was lying or not. When Wheatley speaks Spanish after he takes over the facility, it translates to, You are using this translation software incorrectly. Please consult the manual. The song, Exile Vilify, by The National, is played in a secret area of Chapter 1 in Portal 2. The meaning of the turret opera is a reference to the phrase, It's not over until the fat lady sings. There is a tool in Team Fortress 2 called the Sapper that looks like Wheatley and is voiced by Stephen Merchant. The first section of Portal 2, right after you leave suspension, is just chest chambers 0 to 8 of Portal. In the first test chamber of thermal discouragement beams, you can see the high energy pellet launcher and receiver retract into the ceiling and floor. Test chambers 0 to 8 were changed slightly as chambers 4 and 5 were merged together, and test chamber 1 was changed from an automatic timer changing the portals to buttons that the player has to press. Test chamber 19 can be viewed in a destroyed form in Portal 2 after GLaDOS throws Chell into the incinerator. There is a continuity issue at the end of Portal 2. When Wheatley tries to lock you in a room with turrets, they are all defective and do not work. He replaces them shortly after, but he was using working turrets in the test chambers beforehand. The Emancipation Grills in Portal 2 use a modified text of the Combine Force Field in Half-Life 2. The Emancipation Grills used in Portal have a rotated text of the shields guarding the high energy pellets in City 17 of Half-Life 2. The Edge of Safety Cube does not appear at all in the single player. There are four types of cube in Portal 2. Old Aperture Weighted Storage Cube, New Aperture Weighted Storage Cube, 
weighted companion cube and edgeless safety cube, which is actually a sphere. The companion cube only appears twice in each game. In Portal it appears in Test Chamber 17 and at the end, and in Portal 2 it appears in Test Chamber 7 and at the end in a burnt form. This leads us to believe that it is the same one that was euthanised in Test Chamber 17 of Portal. In Portal and Portal 2 you actually breathe the same room of air over and over again being constantly recycled. And finally, Portal is available on PC, Linux, Mac, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3 and even Android and Portal 2 is available on all of these except for Android. So there's no excuse to have not played it. Thanks for watching, leave a like if you learned something and subscribe to support the channel. Comment below if there's something I missed and I'll see if I can add it.